recording. So welcome everybody. Excited to have you in class today. My name is Curry Sautner. I'm the Chief Learning Officer here at the National Constitution Center. And today we're going to dive into the 14th Amendment, really kind of get our understanding of what the 14th Amendment is, why it, added, it was added to the Constitution, and then the incorporation of the Bill of Rights through the 14th Amendment. And to do all this awesome work is Tom Donnelly, one of our top scholars at the National Constitution Center, and Mr. 14th Amendment himself. Um, so Tom, how excited are you to talk about probably it's your favorite topic, right? It is absolutely my favorite topic. I could not possibly be more excited. <laughs> awesome. Okay. So we always start off with kind of like big questions to get up grounded and centered. But <laughs> students, as you go through class today, if questions pop into your head, put them in the chat put them in the Q&A. We always like to add those pieces. So first big question, you know, what does the 14th Amendment say? We always start with the text, look at the Constitution, and really analyze what it says. What are the core principles around it? How did it transform the Constitution? And how does it promote equality and freedom? And how, what are the connections to the 14th Amendment today? This feels like to me, I can't see a court case that I don't think isn't connected to the 14th Amendment most of the time. So a really relevant topic. So Tom, do you want to start off with the big idea or dive right into the text? Let's go to the text and then get to the big idea. Awesome. There you go. All right. So the 14th Amendment, this is section one of the 14th Amendment. It's a big wall of text, but it's so important that let's read it together just to get it in our heads before we get to the rest of the story. So here goes. All persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state reside. We call that first sentence the citizenship clause. And so now the second sentence is going to have three different clauses in it. The first is no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. We call that the privileges or immunities clause. The next one is nor shall any state deprive any person of life liberty or property without due process of law. That's the due process clause. And then finally, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. That's the equal protection clause. And Curry's right. When you think about the 14th Amendment, it touches on almost every Supreme Court case that we focus on today. Almost every case is going to touch on the 14th Amendment and its protection of freedom and equality in some ways. So in many ways, when we talk about debates over the Constitution in modern times, so many times those are debates over the meaning of this block of text that I just read. And I love how you kind of break down each of the clauses. I was trying to color code it as you spoke. Um, this amendment comes into existence in the 1860s. But you know, when I think about it, I can't think about it without the other two amendments that are, are connected to it. So can you kind of give us like a little time period, timeline grounding around when the 14th Amendment comes into existence? What is around it with the 13th and the 15th Amendment and what's happening at this moment in time? Absolutely. So the 14th Amendment comes in in this amazing wave of transformational amendments that we added to the Constitution after the Civil War. So the Civil War is over, the Republican Party's in charge, and what they're trying to do is figure out what are the important constitutional baselines, the important constitutional rules that we need to set a better constitutional foundation for America after the Civil War. And the bedrock of this period are these three transformational amendments, the 13th, 14th, and 15th. The 13th Amendment was ratified in 1865 and it abolished slavery. The 14th Amendment was ratified in 1868, and it wrote the Declaration of Independence's promise of freedom and equality into the Constitution. And the 15th Amendment was ratified in 1870, and it promised to ban racial discrimination in voting. It's no accident that many scholars on both the left and the right refer to these amendments in this key period known as Reconstruction as America's second founding. I, and so it is, I love that call it the second founding. And I remember the first time I heard that years and years ago, I was like, oh, I get it. And then you have to rethink it. And you're like, it's a second founding for so many reasons. One, because we put in, we finally put the declaration into the constitution and say, let's do this. Let's do this again. Let's do it right. That's the first time I heard it. I heard it as that kind of second founding. And then the next time I thought about it, I was like, it, it shifts and kind of adds so much to the Constitution. 
So it's almost like a re, not a rewriting, but a secondary constitution added to the original constitution. So it's just got a mixed meaning is really all I'm gonna say here, but it's because it's so much going on there. So today we're gonna dive into that 14th amendment and look at the other clauses, but can you, almost like a beautiful water feature, what are all the big features of the 14th amendment that our students should take away at the end of this very quick 30 minute class? Yeah, so there are four big features to the 14th Amendment. These are the four ways that this amendment transformed the Constitution forever. Let's just tick through each of them pretty quickly, just to give you a sense of the power here. The first key feature is birthright citizenship. That's connected to that citizenship clause we read at the beginning. But what this clause says is that Dred Scott v. Sanford decided before the Civil War, it's overturned. That case said, the Supreme Court said that African Americans could not be United States citizens. The 14th Amendment here in its first sentence said, Supreme Court, Chief Justice Roger Brooke Taney, you are wrong. So Dred Scott is overturned. African Americans did have rights that the white man was bound to respect. And if you're born on American soil, you're an American citizen. That includes if you're African American. So that's birthright citizenship. That's the first big idea. The second big idea is equality. And the thing to remember here is that the original constitution was largely silent on the issue of equality. And with the 14th amendment though, we get the declaration of independence promise that all men and women are created equal. It's written into the constitution. It's written in the very text. So that's birthright citizenship, equality. The next big one is freedom. And the big theme here is that, and the big thing to remember here rather, is that the original bill of rights when it's ratified by the founding generation it only applied to the national government. So those soaring protections of free speech, religious liberty, right to a jury trial, those rights are only applying when the national government abuses them. With the 14th Amendment, now we say the Constitution protects those rights against abuses by the states. So those key rights like free speech, religious liberty, after the 14th Amendment, when your state violates those rights, you can use the Constitution to attack them. Lawyers call this process incorporation. We're going to discuss it later in the session. And so that's birthright citizenship, equality, freedom. The final big theme is in Section 5 of the 14th Amendment. It's national power over civil rights. And the big thing here is that the Congress is now given the power to enforce the protections enshrined in the 14th Amendment. The Reconstruction Amendments, the 13th, 14th, and 15th, are the first set of constitutional amendments that actually expand the reach of national power rather than restrict it. So Congress has more power than before. Don't, I don't want to mislead you. It's not like now national government, all powerful Leviathan. That's not the way it is. But what we see is a rebalancing of power between the national government and the states. The national government's getting more power, but debates over federalism, the powers of the national government versus states, they continue all the way up until today. And I, and I love that rebalancing and it brings us back to why they call it a second founding. You know, they're writing the United States Constitution with this fear of the national government. They write these three amendments with this power to the national government. So it is a switch and a, fl a flip from the 150 years or 100 years prior, 100 years prior to that. I can't do math today. Um, when we talk about they write this and they write it, I think we, we always like to make sure that people want to know people like James Madison and all these great, amazing people, but we don't give enough love to John Bingham. And I know this is gonna be a happy moment for you. So Tom, tell us who John Bingham is and why we should understand his name is equal to James Madison. Well, so John Bingham is the primary author of that text we read at the beginning of class, section one of the 14th Amendment. John Bingham himself was a member of Congress. He was in the United States House of Representatives, a representative of Ohio, but he had this amazing career. He was a leading anti-slavery voice in Congress before the Civil War. He was one of the prosecutors of John Wilkes Booth's co-conspirators. He was a leading Republican in the House uh, during Reconstruction. He was a member of the Joint Committee on Reconstruction, which was behind drafting the 14th Amendment and other and thinking of other ways in which we can promise freedom and equality for African Americans. But importantly, finally, again, he was the primary author of Section 1 of the 14th Amendment. The great Justice Hugo Black, one of the great justices of the 20th century, called John Bingham the 14th Amendment's James Madison. And so that's a really good way to think about him. Yeah, I think it's unbelievable. Now let's dive, let's take a deep dive. So we know we know the primary writer. Um, at least of section one, we know kind of the framing of the moment that it's in. Let's kind of tick through those four big features and look at some of the cases that, you know, cause that cause the feature, 
but also tested the feature or weakened it and then kind of go all, see how close we get to modern times on these cases. So do you wanna start with birthright citizenship in the Scott case? Yeah, so this is the citizenship clause. The key, the key case that was behind the creation of the citizenship clause of the 14th Amendment is Dred Scott v. Sanford. And here you could see Dred and Harriet Scott. This case was about, they were, they were enslaved people and they came to the courts and they sued for their freedom. They said, we need to be free. We were brought by the slaveholder onto free soil. And that actually makes us free. The Supreme Court, in, a, in an opinion by Chief Justice Roger Brooktani, said, no, Dred and Harriet Scott, you're wrong. And infamously, he said that African-Americans could, could not be United States citizens and they, quote, had no rights which the white man was bound to respect. This decision was unbelievably controversial in its own day. One of the justices who dissented, Benjamin Curtis, he resigned from the Supreme Court in protest because of Dred Scott. And then when you think about President Lincoln and the Republican Party, one of their key messages as Lincoln's running for president in 1860 is that the Supreme Court was wrong on Dred Scott. We need to take action to ensure that African-Americans can, can, uh, can receive freedom and also be treated more fairly. And so as we're leading into the uh, drafting and ratification of the 14th Amendment, one of the key things the Reconstruction generation wanted to do was to say, no, Supreme Court, you were wrong in Dred Scott. African-Americans can be United States citizens. Um, and they did have rights the white man was bound to respect. But the big principle that we find in the citizenship clause is something that we refer to as birthright citizenship. And so we see a key test of this in the late 1800s in a case called United States versus Wong Kim Ark. And so this is a case, he's invo it's involving a Chinese American. Wong Kim Ark is born in San Francisco. His parents were both Chinese citizens. And so what happens here is that Wong Kim Ark, he, his parents go back to China and he wants to visit his parents. And so he leaves the United States, goes to visit his parents. He tries to get back into the country and the customs officials say, no, 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 you can't come back in. You are not a United States citizen. Although you were born in American soil, you are not a United States citizen. Wang Kimark then goes to court. He challenges this. He says, read, I've read my 14th Amendment. I see that I was born in the United States. I'm subject to the jurisdiction of the United States. I'm a United States citizen. My parents weren't, but I was born here and I'm a United States citizen. And ultimately in a six to, a six to two decision drafted by Justice Horace Gray, the, the Supreme Court says, Wang Kimark, you're right. And so what's the big idea here that the Supreme Court's putting in place? It's the idea that under the 14th Amendment, it doesn't matter who your parents were. It matters where you were born, namely on American soil. Now that the Supreme Court did say there are some exceptions, some narrow exceptions to this rule of birthright citizenship, the key text being subject to the jurisdiction thereof, it creates certain exceptions. One, if you were, you know, uh, if, if you were born of uh, diplomats who had diplomatic immunity, so diplomats from another country, even if you were born here, you wouldn't be a United States citizen. If you were born among an Indian tribe that had, uh, among Native Americans that had tribal immunity against the United States, maybe you wouldn't be a United States citizen. But here, Wang Kimark, you're a Californian. You were born in California, you're a United States citizen. That's what the citizenship clause means. Sorry, I muted myself. I am saying that it's so important to remember these cases and these people because we talk so much about the Constitution and all of it matters, but it's really the people like Harriet Scott, like Dred Scott, like Wong Kim Ark that put the reality into and the courts as well. Now, when we jump into the next section and we look at the meaning of equality in the 14th Amendment, there isn't a better person to start with to look at who can change the constitution and who can ensure that the meaning of the words of the 14th amendment are living up to what they were designed to live up to. So with that, we go to Linda Brown, one of our youngest constitutional heroes. So can you kind of walk us through Brown versus Board of Ed in 1954 and how this kind of taps into that meaning of equality in the 14th amendment? Absolutely, Linda Brown, she's a third grader. She's from Topeka, Kansas. And what does she argue? Well, she and her parents are arguing that I wanna be able to attend the local school in my community here in Topeka, the Sumner School. Um, but unfortunately there's a school policy that segregates the races in education. And so white students and African-American students, they have to attend different schools. And Linda Brown and her parents argue that this is wrong. And so they get together with other parents from other states throughout the country, including South Carolina, Virginia, Delaware, also in Washington, DC, so you have sort of families from all, all, all you know, different regions of the United States. And what they argue is 
the 14th Amendment has to strike down segregation in the schools. Segregation in the schools, the separation of students based on race has to be unconstitutional. But what they have to contend with is that the Supreme Court in 1896 in a case called Plessy v. Ferguson said the separation of African-Americans and white Americans in certain contexts, it's constitutional. So in 1896, the Supreme Court there said uh, it, 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 that, that, thing, that racial segregation, that it's constitutional. So here, Linda Brown and these parents are challenging Plessy v. Ferguson, challenging Plessy v. Ferguson, which said separate but equal is okay under the 14th Amendment. You could separate white Americans from African Americans as long as those facilities are equal. Of course, we know they never really were equal. But even so, the Supreme Court saying that that is a power that's consistent with the powers of the states to protect the health, safety, and welfare of their citizens. And so Linda Brown is part of this broader strategy brought by the NAACP to attack Plessy v. Ferguson, to attack segregation, to attack the system of Jim Crow, which made African-Americans, especially in the South, second-class citizens. And so the NAACP, led by lawyer Thurgood Marshall, brings a series of cases that chip away against this doctrine of separate but equal. It's a decades-long strategy to try to uh, 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 try to attack the legal foundations of segregation. But finally, in Brown versus Board of Education, Thurgood Marshall, Linda Brown, her parents, they decide to go for the really, in, in, in many ways, sort of the, 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 the most pervasive feature of, of, of this system of seg Jim Crow segregation, which is the segregation of the schools. And what happens in a unanimous decision by the Supreme Court authored by Chief Justice Oral Warren, Chief Justice Warren says, Plessy v. Ferguson was wrong. It was wrong the day it was decided. We, the Supreme Court, were wrong. Linda Brown, parents, you are right. In the end, segregation of the schools is inconsistent with the 14th Amendment. It violates the 14th Amendment's um, uh, promise of equality. Um, and in this context, it doesn't matter. Separate in, in the context of education, separate but equal has no place. It doesn't even matter if you provide equal facilities. The very act of separating out students by race brands African-American students with such a feeling of inferiority and second-class citizenship that that damage has to violate the 14th Amendment. And it's unbelievably powerful. And a court case that students, if you haven't dived into it in class and like unpacked it, it is un unbelievably powerful to unpack what the court says, um, Brown 1, Brown 2, all those pieces. Now, Thomas, we kind of to keep kind of walking through this push for equality. There's a few other kind of moments in time before we jump to freedom. So we can look at the, the Civil Rights Act or Loving v. Virginia, kind of two other big moments in time that wrap around this idea of equality. I mean, yeah, equality. Well, yeah, so like the, Brown happens in 1954. There's a big reaction against Brown in many school districts, especially throughout the South, where they do not uh, desegregate the schools. But the push continues. And it's a reminder that constitutional change, it doesn't just happen by lawyers and courts. It just doesn't happen by Supreme Court cases. It happens by people often pushing for change in all branches of government and on the streets over time. So we have the civil rights movement building and building in strength through the 1950s into the early 1960s. And finally, we get two really huge landmark laws passed during this period. One of them is the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And so this is one that expands the reach of equality into a ton of different settings. It's a big law. It's passed, again, a decade after Brown. And it's really just one of the most sweeping civil rights laws ever passed in American history. The year after that, they then passed the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which breathes life into the 15th Amendment and promises equal access to the vote based on race. And this is a monumentally important uh, 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 statute to promote equality in the United States. And finally, in 1967, the Supreme Court strikes down laws banning interracial marriage in a case known as Loving v. Virginia. And so here, these are laws that say if, if, that white Americans and African Americans, they cannot marry. They still existed in a few states in the South, including Virginia. And here, the Supreme Court says, of course, that violates the 14th Amendment. Of course, it does. And I just really so much appreciate that you point out that it's not just the Supreme Court that pushes for the amendments to be used the way they should be or overturn past cases, that it's we the people too, kind of moving these forward. You can amend the constitution, you can you know, interpret the constitution through the courts and you can use the power of the people to make the branches act in all different ways to ensure that our rights are being met. So thank you for like kind of 
bifurcating and pulling that all out because there's lots of different action that we can have to change the constitution or add to the constitution. And before we jump into looking at the, the feature around freedom, do you want to take one beat and we'll go into incorporation next, but just on gender equality. So it brings us back in time just a little bit, but it might be a nice little path that we look at. How did the 14th Amendment help to ensure the fight for women to have equality based on gender? Yeah, so after the 14th and 15th Amendments are ratified, one of the first things that happens and one of the first groups that lays claim to it are women. And these are women fighting for equal access to jobs and in one case, uh, the, the right to practice law or an equal access to the right to vote. These are cases like Bradwell versus Illinois and Minor v. Happer said. And so these are women saying that the 14th Amendment speaks of all persons, we're persons. It speaks of our rights too. And we should be treated equally in this context. We should have an equal access to the ability to practice law and also the right to vote. The Supreme Court rejects these arguments in that time. So this is in the, the this is all the way like the, 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 the uh, 1770s uh, I'm sorry, 1870s. Um, and, but it, it's, it's a basically a century later where we finally see the Supreme Court reverse course. And this is a litigation strategy that's developed by a lawyer named Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Before she sits on the Supreme Court, she in many ways is the Thurgood Marshal of the women's rights movement before the Supreme Court, arguing that the 14th Amendment must apply to women, must promote equality for women. And ultimately, in the, in the 1970s, she secures a series of victories before the Supreme Court that extends the protection of the Equal Protection Clause to women. And then finally, once she's on the Supreme Court in 1996, she authors a landmark decision on the 14th Amendment and sex equality known as Virginia versus United States. There, the court rules that the Virginia Military Institute's male-only policy violated the Equal Protection Clause. So this is a military academy in Virginia that only men could attend it. They had a separate, they had a separate uh, academy for women that wasn't as well established, didn't, you know, just basically wasn't as prestigious. And what Justice Ginsburg said is that under the 14th Amendment, if you wanna set up something like this separately for men, you, Virginia, you need a quote, exceedingly persuasive justification. You need a really, really, really good reason to treat the, uh, the two sexes differently. And Justice Ginsburg said really powerfully, sex classifications may not be used as they once were to create or perpetuate the legal, social, or economic inferiority of women. It's awesome. I'm just going to hold that quote for a hot second um, and really kind of pull it together. Now, as we're wrapping up in the last seven minutes, we can dive into free, the, the next feature, which is around freedom. But it really has so much to do with that listing of rights that we believe our freedoms are held into. So the protections of the Bill of Rights and this idea of incorporation. So when we talk about incorporation and what the 14th Amendment did to us, I always think about it like a gift that it ensures that the Bill of Rights not only you know, tells the federal government what it can't do, but it, now it gives the Bill of Rights to every single individual in the United States and say, these are yours. They are your rights, they're your shield, and the 14th Amendment is really used to help ensure that. So can you walk us through the idea of incorporation and how, it wasn't like a grand slam, 14th Amendment's written, check, incorporation's done. How did it actually proceed? How were each one of the Bill of Rights incorporated? That's a great question, Curry. So yeah, incorporation is just this big idea that the Bill of Rights, when it's initially ratified, it only applies to the national government and then with incorporation through the 14th Amendment, many of those rights in the Bill of Rights then apply to state abuses. And part of this is for the drafters and ratifiers of the 14th Amendment, they're learning the lessons of the Civil War and pre-Civil War America. So they're looking back, they're looking at pre-Civil War America and what are some of the evils they see in pre-Civil War America? Well, in many of the slaveholding states, those slaveholding states disrespected core Bill of Rights freedoms. They banned abolitionist speech, anti-slavery preaching, anti-slavery assembly. And so part of what the Reconstruction generation is trying to accomplish through the 14th Amendment is to ensure that states can't abuse core freedoms like that. And so you're right, Curry, this wasn't just a slam dunk. There was a, you know, there's a key case before the Civil War in 1833, Barron v. Baltimore, where Chief Justice Marshall says, yes, the Bill of Rights, it only applies to the national government. But even after we ratify the 14th Amendment, in 1868, it takes a while for this idea of incorporation to catch on. 
There were early decisions by the Supreme Court in the 1870s, 1880s, and 1890s that do not incorporate key freedoms against the states. It's really not until 1925 that the Supreme Court begins what we call the incorporation revolution in earnest in a case called Gitlow versus New York. There it applied the First Amendment's protection of freedom of speech and the press against the states. So it's a really important right, but that's 1925. It's not, that's a lot of American history before we end up expanding the protection of the Bill of Rights to go against state abuses. And then over time, we carry on a process known as selective incorporation, which means the Supreme Court hears individual challenges on different rights, whether it's free speech, free press, religious liberty, jury trial, unreasonable searches and seizures, any of those amendments, they go case by case. And they ask the question, should this right be incorporated against the states? Should this right apply against the states? And what we see is, especially as we get into the 1950s, 60s and beyond, is that the answer is increasingly yes. The Supreme Court says, yes, we're going to apply these broad protections in the Bill of Rights against state abuses so that over time, we now only have only a few rights that haven't been incorporated against the states. It's the Third Amendment's protection um, against quartering of soldiers in your home, the Fifth Amendment's protection of a grand jury right, and the Seventh Amendment's protection of a civil jury right. But over time, the key point is that incorporation, this use of the 14th Amendment to apply the Bill of Rights to state abuses has turned the Bill of Rights into a genuine charter of national freedom where some of our most cherished liberties are applied just as strongly against the national government as they are against state and local governments. And it's so often we think about, you know, these rights as the Constitution. So when we, you know, we talk to people across the country, you know, you talk about the Constitution and their minds are instantly going to this. And to think that it not only took the 14th Amendment, but also all of those work in all those cases to incorporate the 14th Amendment. Um, it really kind of shifts the balance and makes you understand that the fight for freedom is a continuous struggle and has been over the course of our history and sometimes with big rollbacks and big pushbacks. Now, when we start to kind of think about these protections and incorporation, um, we it, it brings me back to some of the more modern cases, um, but it brings me back to Loving v. Virginia. So do you wanna kind of move us towards the modern cases, starting with Loving and then doing kind of a walkthrough into, um, we'll end with the, uh, uh, Congress has more power clause. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, the, the, the key thing here, so Loving v. Virginia, it's dealing with, it's a case that really deals with both the promise of equality and the promise of freedom. But a lot of the case is about whether or not there is a, a, a right to marry in the Constitution. And so this brings up this big question of, does the Constitution protect certain rights that aren't clearly listed in the Constitution? So, so uh, uh, scholars call these unenumerated rights, they're unwritten rights. And there are arguments on both sides as to whether or not the court should recognize rights that aren't explicitly mentioned in the Constitution. For those who argue in favor of these unwritten rights, they say the Constitution itself points to the existence of unwritten rights. The Ninth Amendment says that the rights listed in the Constitution don't exhaust all of the rights retained by the people. And some scholars argue that also the 14th Amendment's own language talking broadly about the privileges or immunities of American citizens could speak not just to the Bill of Rights, but more broadly to rights that aren't listed in the Constitution. The argument against is that why would we trust judges to discover rights? They're unelected, they're unaccountable. These are some of the most heated and important debates in American society. Why would we leave them to judges? And so we see over time debates over big uh, rights like the right to privacy, the right to an abortion, things like that. These are all things that fall under unenumerated or unwritten rights. Uh, but the key case of Loving Virginia, again, speaks to this right to marry. And so there, again, the court strikes down a ban on interracial marriage in Virginia. Now, the, these laws went back to the 1800s. 16 states still had these laws in the books in 1967. So it's not as though it just one or two states that were out there, but the court rules that laws like these violate the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause, but also a right to marry that the court discovers in the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment. The court concludes these laws unquestionably discriminated based on race, but they also violate this fundamental right to marry. Here's a powerful passage by Earl Warren explaining his reasoning here, the freedom to marry has long been recognized as one of the vital personal rights essential to the orderly pursuit of happiness by free men. Marriage is one of the basic civil rights of man fundamental to our very existence and survival. So there's a way in which, where is he finding this right, this freedom to marry? In part, he's drawing on what he sees to be a powerful tradition 
that extends back decades upon decades and establishes the right to marry as an important right within America. But then we see this battle then also uh, uh, be rejoined again in 2015 in the case of Obergefell versus Hodges. And so there the court, it's, we're dealing with state bans on same-sex marriage, and the court divides five to four. It's a really, really closely contested argument. In part, what the two sides are arguing about are the proper role of the courts in discovering new rights and also the, the legacy of Loving Free Virginia. So the majority opinion written by Justice Anthony Kennedy draws on many of the arguments we see uh, Chief Justice Warren make in Loving v. Virginia and effectively extends Loving to the context of same-sex marriage. And the, but in dissent, what we see is uh, the, prim, the principal dissent, that, uh, there's actually four separate dissents. The main dissent is by Chief Justice John Roberts. And what he argues is, you know, he, he urges caution of the court discovering new rights. He says that the battle over same-sex marriage is something that it's a roiling debate in the United States politically. It's one that a lot of people are engaged in. It's one where a lot of minds have been changed. And it's certainly the case that history seems to be moving in the direction of couples like Jim Obergefell uh, and his husband. But in the end, what Chief Justice Roberts urges is caution in the courts recognizing a new right. And he says, in this context, when you're dealing with a hot topic of constitutional controversy, a right that's not listed in the constitution specifically, that, that prudence and humility should allow the courts to leave that to the political process. So you see a powerful argument on behalf of rights by the majority and sort of a powerful argument on behalf of the political process and majoritarian decision-making and decision-making by the elected branches by the dissent. So if you really wanna understand these debates over these unwritten rights and also just the proper role of the courts in our constitutional system and where you come down on that debate, Reading Justice Kennedy, his majority opinion, and Chief Justice Roberts' dissent is a good way to orient your own thinking and see some of the best arguments on both sides. And you're absolutely right. It is, and I love that you wrapped in the methods. You talked about prudence. Um, you talked about other methods that constitutional lawyers use to, to explain their case and to say why that they have weight on this side. So it's not just two great ways to look at this issue, but at the same time, you see how they're using their skills as constitutional experts to say, this is why we're saying this. We're giving you evidence for our argument, which is the best part of a civil discourse and dialogue is when people come to the table and then cite their evidence or their reasoning and why they're looking at the constitution this way. So Tom, thank you so much for wrapping us up with the 14th amendment. There's just two real quick follow-up questions um, one is on Gitlow, and I knew you'd love that question. So the question around Gitlow, let me read it exactly so I don't get it wrong. Um, how does the due process uh, clause apply to the First Amendment? Um, in that case, what is, what is due process? That's a great question. So it, it, I, don't, I, I don't want people to get tripped up too much in the technicalities when it comes to incorporation, but there are two key clauses that could have to do with incorporation and the 14th Amendment. One is the privileges or immunities clause. The other is the due process clause. The, in Gitlow versus New York, when the Supreme Court is incorporating the First Amendment's protection of free speech and a free press, they use the due process clause of the 14th Amendment. When the court incorporates other rights after that, they use the due process clause of the 14th Amendment. In part, this is a function of less of, I don't know, abstract reasoning than it is just practical legal decision making. The reason being that in the 1870s, 1880s, the Supreme Court reads the Privileges or Immunities Clause really, really narrowly. The, the classic case is the Slaughterhouse Cases in 1873, which is the key case addressing um, the, fourth, the, first, the first key case addressing the 14th Amendment. The court effectively reads the Privileges or Immunities Clause out of the Constitution. And so as the court is looking to incorporate Bill of Rights protections and recognize other freedoms, the court then turns the Due Process Clause in you know, cases leading up to Gitlow, but then in 1925 embraces it in the context of the incorporation revolution. In part, again, there, there are arguments, you can read some of the scholarship on it, that, do, that the sort of classic due process has to do with procedures, so making sure that you're treated fairly, but there is a broader discourse around the idea of due process that can also sometimes speak about arbitrary actions that violate core rights. The due process clause also speaks of liberty. And so the Supreme Court, I think, use both due process and liberty together to argue that, you know, that is one way to incorporate uh, key rights. But it's certainly a controversial move uh, to use the due process clause, one that's still debated. You still see uh, justices that broadly support incorporation, like Justice Clarence Thomas, 
like Justice Neil Gorsuch, say incorporation is consistent with the original meaning of the 14th Amendment, but the due process clause may not have been the right clause in which to do it. But the Supreme Court there was sort of using the clause that was still available because they didn't want to overturn an old case. Got it. And I now just want to look at the 14th Amendment and pick it apart word for word, which is my favorite thing to do, but we don't have time for that. Um, so Uriel wanted to know earlier in class, does the 14th Amendment give birth to the principle, and I might say this wrong, of just soul? Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And that's exactly right. The thing is, like, there's a debate prior to the 14th Amendment about whether you know, uh, whether birthright citizenship is actually the rule that should apply in the United States, because there's nothing specifically in the original constitution about like how citizenship should work. And so President Lincoln and the Republican Party supported birthright citizenship, said it was most entrenched in the American tradition and law. There were people who disagreed, like, like uh, Chief Justice Taney. And the 14th Amendment then took on the idea of birthright citizenship, birth, that, that citizenship follows where you were born, wrote it into the Constitution. Of course, there's still debates over how broadly that sweeps and that key language subject to the jurisdiction thereof that Wong Kim Ark turned on. It was a six to two decision because six of the justices said Wong Kim Ark wins and that that language wouldn't apply to him. The dissenters thought that language should apply to him because his parents were Chinese citizens. And so, you know, there, there's, there's sort of debates about that language and obviously intersects today with the citizenship rights of, uh, of, 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 those, uh, of those born of undocumented folks. That's where the, in the political debates, those debates are still exist and they exist precisely over that language of subject to the jurisdiction thereof. Awesome, and this is why I love with all parts of the constitution, but even more with the 14th amendment, like parsing out the words and examining them and then looking at the cases and then looking at the words again. It's a very nice kind of back and forth um, tool that you can do around the 14th amendment. I think that wraps up most of our questions for today. Uh, Tom, thank you so much. This was so fun. But again, as always, keep an eye on the cases because you'll see the 14th amendment being referenced and also keep looking back at the words because they are something that every time you look at them, you see something different and you see something more and new. So it's really entertaining. Yeah, and this is a, just a classic area where you we always say read all the opinions, but this is an area where the debates are ongoing. They often hit us really close to home and it's really important for us to read the arguments on all sides, what all the justices are saying, what all key figures in American history are saying to see you know, which we think is right. Yeah, and I think it's so interesting, especially when you look at the cases, you may not agree with the opinion or the dissent, but when you read it, is it the case that you understand the perspective and saying that's a really good argument? And that's what I find with so many of these cases, especially the ones coming out in the last 20 years. It's like, I don't always agree with the outcome that you would like with that opinion or dissent, but I love the way you, you said it, <laughs> you know, really great writing, great ideas. Read the opinion, read the dissent. Always a good one. Thank you, Tom. No problem. Thank you, Curry. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day, everyone. Awesome. Great. Cool. See you, Tom.